Good morning again. When we prepare the worship service, we now have to think about not just terms of what we do here, but how that communicates through uh, the live stream. And uh, sometimes there are certain things we do here that um, that doesn't really communicate well. And so we really want to make sure this time, and the time we have of just the quiet preparation of our hearts would be something that you would appreciate and it would help you, not only that you would come and talk to God, but you also would be able to hear God speak to you and you'd hear his voice. And I'm hoping that those of you that are watching online would also take that time to just be quiet and to be still before the Lord. Uh, God has always promised us that if we'll be still before him, then we'll come to know that he is God as we take time to be still. You know that passage of scripture in Psalm, he says, be still and know that I am God. And the very next word was, I will be exalted. And we want that to happen. And we want to happen in your lives here, if you're here with us in person, but also as you join us in uh, live streaming uh, as well. Um, from time to time, I get a chance to watch uh, that live streaming service. I might be out of town or uh, when I had COVID, I got a chance to do that. And I, I always enjoyed this, noticing that folks that are online are, are responding and, and commenting and making comments uh, about there. And the number one comment is, I can't hear. <laughs> and it might have been earlier in the service, you didn't hear, and that was my fault. Uh, I thought my microphone was on, and it's not, it wasn't. I thought it was on mute, and I hit the mute button and got up here and began to realize I'm not hearing anything either through the speakers. And so... That was not the sound, the sound team, the audio-visual team's fault. That was my fault. And uh, so write your cards and letters to me <laughs> and your apologies to them, okay, uh, for some of the things you might have said as you were watching online because you couldn't hear uh, this morning. This morning we're going to begin a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments, uh, guidelines for God's people. Uh, and we'll start this morning by thinking about the fact that we are called to be God's people. But as we begin this morning, the, the question that some of you might have was why? I mean, why do we need to take our time to do a series of messages? And you can kind of figure out that there's 10 commandments. There's going to be at least 10 messages. Um, well, I'm doing an introductory sermon this morning, so there's going to be at least 11 sermons. And I'll make you aware of the fact that I'm going to follow up with another sermon afterwards. There'll be 12 sermons. But, but why? Why are we going to spend time? I mean, we're God's people. We've been called to God um, through our relationship with Jesus Christ. We've been saved by faith, um, by grace, rather, through faith. Uh, we're not saved through the law. We're, we're not bound to the Ten Commandments as a way of being saved and being God's people. So, so why does it even have any application to our lives? And the reason is real simple. Because, see, the Ten Commandments are principles for those folks that are called to be God's people. And in Christ, we are called to be the people of God. Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses. And they were given, to God, uh, uh, given by God to Moses that he would share with the people of God after they, God had delivered them from Egypt. God was calling his people he had delivered to become his people. They were to be called specifically, um, he says that you would, they would be a special treasure above all people uh, to him. And he was calling them in a covenant relationship. And therefore he set before them some principles of how they would live in that covenant with him and in community with him and also in community with them. In the New Testament, those that come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, we are now called to be God's new people. But we're still called to be the people of God. Listen to how Peter describes us in 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. This morning we're going to be reading from Exodus chapter 19 in just a second. And there you're going to begin to realize Peter had borrowed his language from the Old Testament. He had borrowed it from this passage. When God was calling the people he had delivered from, Israel, from Egypt to be his special people. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? 
Exodus chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. I'll read through verse 8. You follow along. In the, month, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I brought you on eagles' wings, bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if indeed you will indeed hear, obey my voice, and keep my com commandment, then you shall be to me a special treasure, to me above all. All people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders and for the, of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. And the people, oh, then all the people answered together and they said, All the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people. To the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we come this morning acknowledging that we are called to be your people through our relationship with Jesus Christ. We come this morning to declare that you indeed are our God and we'll have no other gods before you. And Father, you have called us to commit our lives to you and we want to, to do that this morning. And Lord, we come again, as your people. And this morning, my desire is that you would teach us all that's involved in being the people of God, that we would acknowledge your call and we would respond in a manner, Father, that pleases you. So speak to us. Help us to hear your voice. I ask that your Holy Spirit would be our leader, our guide this morning, not only as we worship, but Father, as we listen. And we would hear you speak. And Father, your Spirit would lead us to respond. We thank you, Father, that we can trust you in these things as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Three months after being delivered from the, from the from a bondage in Egypt, Moses and the people stood at Mount Sinai, and they did so because God had promised Moses that that's what they were going to do. If you go back to chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, you'll see that God had made a promise to, to Moses there when he said, I will certainly be with you, and I shall be a sign to you that I have sent you and this will be a sign to you that, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God and Moses was back on that mountain. God was meeting him there. The people were there. God had kept his promise. This is what I'm going to do. God had called him to deliver the people, to go and to, to Pharaoh, to demand that Pharaoh let God's people go. And, and now because God had been faithful, there they were. There they, were be, there they were worshiping God on that mountain. God had said it happened. God had brought it to pass. But something else was going on there that day. Something very specific, and this would become one of the most significant events in the whole life of the people of Israel. God was, a, was calling them into a covenant relationship with them. And God was going to lay out before them the, the principles, the guidelines. This is what it means to be my people. This is how you're going to live now because you are my people. You are a special people to me. And you're going to be known now from this very point as the, as the unique people of God. Unfortunately, after this time of covenant, that they agreed to, their history wasn't so glamorous. As a matter of fact, one theologian has described the Old Testament as the history of Israel's failure to be the people of God. They, they failed to be all that God had intended them to be. Now, let's not be too hard on them. Let's just be honest. If we'll pay attention to their history, we'll begin to realize our own journeys are kind of like theirs because we've got our failures too, don't we? 
but we can rejoice in the fact that they were as faithful as they were because they were that faithful. God was able to use them to write his salvation history. And he would do so through their lives. They would be the instrument. But also out of them would come the one who would be the savior of the world. And that is specifically pertinent for us this morning because you see, because of that one, because of Jesus Christ, you and I now, through faith in him, we can become the people of God. And that's important. If the Old Testament was the story of God's calling to himself a covenant people to be his people, now the New Testament is the story of God's call to a new people that would be his covenant people. And therefore, because we are the people of God, the, God, the Ten Commandments continue to be pertinent to our lives, not because through the way that we are saved, and it's not through them that we become the people of God. They are pertinent to us because we have been saved through faith in Jesus Christ, and through faith in Him, we also have been called to be the people of God. But here now are the principles and the guidelines. You see, here's the deal. Though you and I are free from the law, we're not free to live our lives any way we choose. We are called to be God's people. And that means something. There's something significant about what it means to be the people of God. Our lives are to be distinguished from the other folks. God said, you're going to be a special treasure to me. And I want you to hear this. God said, all the earth is mine, but you're going to be special. There's something special about who you are. He said that to Israel, and he says that to you and me today as well. Whenever a king owned a, comp a country, he owned everything in that country. It was just understood. He was sovereign. He had authority over all of it. And whatever he wanted was his. And so, therefore, you may have possession of it, but you were just a steward. If he wanted it, he'd come and get it. So the king, because he, everything belonged to him, would, would set aside certain things that were his, uniquely his, specially his. He might have some, a, a little treasure box there with full of gems and stones and they were this, they, these were, his, were uniquely his. And that's what God says about you and about me. God owns all the earth, but you and I are his in a very special and unique fashion through what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand some more of the dynamics of what it means this morning to be called to be God's people. Number one, we are called to be God's people by God's grace. We are called to be the people of God by grace. It is an act of grace on God's part that you and I are the people of God. The very first word that God spoke here to his people, excuse me, one of those Sundays when I've got to have something more in my mouth, I'm going to cough or else I'm going to be too dry. But this morning, but here, God said to his people, I'm calling you and it's all because of grace. Listen to these words that he says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I've borne you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. When had God done that? When did God do that? He did it before he called them to be his people. He called them while they were slaves. He, he had done all that while they were slaves and they were caught up in bondage there in Egypt. And God had acted. And he said, you know, it's sort of like the, the eagle. And he was comparing himself to the eagle, one of the most majestic of all birds. He's known as the king of the birds. Though a bird of prey, still because he could soar so high, the folks who stood in awe of the eagle. And God said, you know, I'm like that eagle. And that the eagle many times will bear its young on its own back. So I have borne you on my wings. As I brought you out of Egypt, delivered you through the Passover? As I delivered you there at the Red Sea when Pharaoh and his army were pressing in to recapture you and take you back into slavery, and yet I destroyed, I, I carried you safely through the Red Sea and destroyed Pharaoh and his army. There in the wilderness when you were thirsty, I provided you water. There in the, in the, in the wilderness when you were hungry, I provided you manna. There in the wilderness when you faced enemies, I delivered you from the Amalekites. I was bearing you on eagles' wings, God saying to the people. I want you to stop this morning and think about who you are as a child of God, as one of God's special people. 
and to realize that God's first word to you was a word of grace. Words like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How is that a word of, God, a word of, of grace? Well, stop and think about the last part of that. So that we might not perish. Why would we perish? Because of who we were. We were sinners. Paul would write and say, for God has demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, God did all that for us before we deserved it. Before we earned it. Because we could never deserve it. We could never earn it. That's what makes it grace. Stop and think about your own journey of faith. Where you are today. What has gone on in your life that brings you to be here today? Just, just, just the things in your own life. As I think about my own life and my own journey of faith, I have to be honest with you, I have to go beyond the time I was even born to a time when a 17-year-old boy in a country church in Putnam, I mean in Polk County, Florida, his church preparing for a, work, for a revival service involved in cottage prayer meetings in that church began to start questioning and thinking seriously about his relationship with God and wanted to be sure that he was saved. And on that, that during that time, a godly man in that church helped Gordon Mott make his mind up about Jesus Christ. You see, that's important for me because it was that day set the stage for the, my dad's life where he was going to go in terms of his life in Christ and his life as a person who belonged to God's people. So that when I was born, I was born into a Christian home where my mom and dad both loved Jesus and wanted to make sure that I grew up loving Jesus. And that was, I mean, what did I have to do with that? How did I earn that? That was God's pure grace in my life. Would I know Christ today? Would I follow him as Lord and Savior in my life today? Had it not been for that? I don't know. But I know that's a part of God's grace in my life where he brought me to this point today. I could go on to talk to you about how as a 15-year-old boy God called me to preach. How he led me to Stetson University and because of the faithfulness of giving on the part of, so, of a, a group of people called Florida Baptist, I was able to go to four years of seminary absolutely tuition free. We just had to pay for my, my way there and back, my room and board while I was there, and my books. That was a big savings back in those days, even a greater saving today. I went on to Southern Seminary, and Southern Seminary, because of a group of people called Southern Baptist, who believed it was important to invest in the lives of, of young preachers, boys that are growing up to study to be preachers, they again made it possible that I paid very, very little to get a graduate education. While I was in Stetson, God introduced me to a young lady named Marilyn, and you know how the rest of that story went. That was God's grace in all my life. I was called to Moultrie Baptist Church in St. Augustine. I was called to Seminole First Baptist Church some 22 years ago. That's all God's grace. God bearing me up on eagle's wings. Now you think about your story. What has God been doing in your life over your story? You need to go back and think about those things. You need to record those things. You need to celebrate those things. Because it reminds you, you have been called to be God's special people. Not because of who you are. Not because of what you've done. But because of his grace. And you need to celebrate that. Secondly, we are called to be God's people by God's choice. Someone has written and said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. Well, odd or not, that's what God did. God chose them. And he chose them again to be his special people. Out of all the peoples of the earth, God said, you're going to be special to me. Years later, as Moses would prepare the children of Israel to finally enter into the promised land. You've got to remember now, this has been after 40 years of their stubbornness and after their failure to always be obedient and trust God and to follow God. But as he prepared to send them into the promised land, God, Moses reminded them, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. 
a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. He said, the Lord your God has chosen you. God's sovereign choice. He chose, and he could have chosen all, but he chose you. He chose you when he chose Abraham, your father, years and years and generations before. He, he chose you as you remained faithful to his covenant relationship with Abraham through Isaac and then through Jacob. And then as you came to Egypt, to your family came to Egypt to escape the famine. And then there came along a Pharaoh who, who didn't know Joseph, but God still continued to remember his choice. He had chosen you. You were going to be special to him. And he continued to be faithful to that call that he had upon your life. He remembered that, but he chose you. And so therefore, you're special. You know, sometimes you see a child who, who, who they think they're special. You know what I mean? They just think that they're better than anybody else. And sometimes when we hear God saying, you're, you're my special people, we think that means we're better than everybody else. And I want to tell you something. We are better. We're better off. But we're not any superior to anybody because of that. We have a better future and a better hope. But we're, we're, we're no different than anybody else. And there's no reason for arrogance on our part. This is all about God's sovereign choice in our lives. And it was for Israel. And it's important for us to understand, when you understand Israel in human history, <coughs> excuse me, there are some people who hate Israel because of this. And because they don't understand. That Israel was chosen to be God's people for a purpose. For God's purpose. This was not for them to somehow think themselves better than anybody else on all the earth. Though later in their history, there would be a time in which Jews would think about Gentiles, that Gentiles were only good to fuel the fires of hell. And they would have some other special terms to refer to Gentiles by that showed their contempt because they weren't God's people. And there's no place for that in you and I, God calling us to be his people. So we would think about anybody who's not yet a part of the family of God and a part of the kingdom of God and a part, a part of the people of God. They would never think somehow that we're superior to them. But we'd understand that God chose us for a purpose. God chose Israel for a purpose. They were to be to him a kingdom of priests. The whole nation... God would later set apart, set apart Abraham, Aaron and his sons. They would serve as God's priests. They would serve as those individuals who would serve God and his purposes as a minister to the people. They would represent the people to God and they would represent God to the people. They would be bridge builders, if you will. They had unique responsibilities. They had unique duties. They had unique privileges because they were priests. But God said first to the whole nation, you're going to be a nation of priests. This is your job. And that primary job was to be the bridge between me and others. So that you would represent me to the world and represent the world before me. That's what God was calling Israel to do. They would be a missionary people. The world was to come to know God through them. That was the call. And they were to be a holy nation. He says specifically, you're to be a holy nation. You're to be a holy people. Because your character needs to reflect my character. You need to reflect me to the world so that when the world looks at you, they can see me. That's what God was saying to Israel. That was their plan, his plan and his purpose. So that God's choice of them was not so much for them as it was for him, for his purposes, and for the rest of the world that needed to know him. And they were privileged to be the instruments through which God would continue his redemptive ministry in the world, seeking to reach a whole world so that whole world might come to know him and worship him as God. And now today, as the new people of God and through faith in Jesus Christ, who are we called to be? Peter uses the same words. We're called to be a kingdom of priests. 
we're called to be God's go-betweens. This is how the world will know him. We'll represent God to the world. And we'll also represent the world before God. And we'll be priests. In the New Testament, there is a wonderful doctrine called the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. Every believer is a priest before God. And we're a priest to the world representing God to the rest of the world. Now, when we think about that, we get some other wonderful teachings that will help us understand that, you know, you don't need anybody to stand between you and God other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ now is your great high priest. So when you pray, you don't have to come to a man to pray. You pray to God through Christ Jesus so that you have instant access into the very throne room of God because of who you are in Jesus Christ. That's a part of your priesthood. You can take the word of God and you can read it for yourself. And you can understand it as you begin to uh, apply principles of learning and you begin to understand the scriptures and understand the story that's there. The Holy Spirit will enlighten your understanding. You know, I heard about a pastor who's told his people, you come here so I can tell you what God's word says and so you'll understand God's word. That's why you come to church here. No, that's not the reason you come to church here. You can do that for yourself. You can study. Now we need to come together But God's Holy Spirit in you, you can read God's Word and you can share God's Word with others because of who you are. But it also means that as you go before the Father, you have an opportunity to pray for others and especially intercede for those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your calling. Call to be God's people, to be a a priest, a missionary people, whereby the world might come to know God through our lives. And we might represent the world before the Father, asking him to move in such a way that those that don't know him might come to know him. Asking him to use us that we might be that people that would introduce the world to the Father. But in the process, we too are to be a holy people. There's a uniqueness about who we're supposed to be. We're to be distinct, and our lifestyle is to reflect that distinction. As we seek to reflect God's character and allow his character to be reflected in our lives so that who he is, how he is, his character might become our character. And the world might understand his holiness because they see us. To be holy is to be separate. Literally, that's what the word at means. It means to be set apart. We're set apart for God, for his purposes. But we're also set apart by the quality and the character of our lives. That's our calling. That's what it means to be the people of God. And we can't get away from that. We're so busy trying to be like the world. We were never called to be like the world. We're called to be distinct from the world. We're not to be ugly about that. We're not to be, again, some attitude of superiority because of that. There's something different about who we are or ought to be. And it ought to reflect the glory of God and the beauty of Christ so that the world would want to know who we are, I mean, who it is that makes a difference in our lives and that they too might become like we are. It's this holiness that God calls us to. But I want to remind you, we're, called, we're, called, we're chosen for God and for his redemptive purposes in the world. Listen to Peter again. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You hear that? That you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of his darkness into his marvelous light. You are to be a witness of the saving power of Jesus Christ to a world that needs to know that saving power. That's our call. And God has chosen you for this purpose. Chosen. Stop and think about that for a moment. If anything ought to be an ego boost for you this morning, that one truth ought to be. You were chosen. Think back to the days of Sandlot baseball. And remember what it was felt like when you were the last one chosen. Or maybe nobody wanted you on their team at all. And compare that to when you were the first person or among the first to be chosen on that team. And the difference 
And God has said, I want you to be a part of my team. I want you to think about marriage. And I want you to think about the fact that, that he chose you when he, when he, when he uh, proposed. That was, he was making his choice. And, and he wanted you. And, and fellas, when she said yes, she was choosing you. You were her choice. Think about that. Now I want you to think about this. God has chosen you in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, he chooses you to be his very own, to be special, to be a priest, and to be holy, and to be a part of his redemptive purpose in, the light, in this world. This was Israel's purpose. She failed. This is our purpose as the new people of God. Are we going to fail? Well, Something else you need to understand. God's call to be his people demands our response. And when, Israel, when Moses laid out to, to, the, to the people of Israel that God was choosing them to be his, his kingdom of priests and his holy nation, that they were to be special to God out of all the peoples of the earth, they responded and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They made a commitment. They made a promise. And they said, we're going to follow up that promise with obedience. I'd like to tell you about all how they were so obedient. Like I said, I already told you, most of the Old Testament is how they were disobedient to what God had called them to do and be. But I want to say to you this morning that for you and me, God's call upon our lives still requires a response. It's a response of obedience as well as the response of a total commitment. The commitment, we come before God and we're not saved and we don't become his people because we made this commitment. We've already been saved. God's grace has already been offered to us. We, we've already been called. His choice has already been revealed. But now the choice is that whether or not we're going to be faithful to that call is going to be whether or not we're going to say yes and we're going to follow up that yes with what? Obedience. It, it's always with obedience. We're saved by grace through what? Faith. And what does Peter tell, I mean, um, James tell us about faith. That faith, real faith, is always evidenced by obedience, by works. You're not saved by following the Ten Commandments. You don't become a pe uh, the people of God by committing yourself to be obedient to the Ten Commandments. But you're obedient to God and to his call because you are saved. Because he's are, you already are a child of God. But if you're going to be a child of God, and the world's going to see you as a child of God, you must commit yourself, say yes, and then follow up with obedience. God's call to be his people always requires our response. God's relationship with his people is always based upon his choice and upon his grace. God took the initiative to love us and to call us to himself and to act on our behalf in the person of Jesus Christ, to provide for our forgiveness, all so that we might become his people. And he did all that while we were still sinners. But now, all we can do is come to him by faith and receive what he has already done for us and receive this special relationship that he offers us. But how faithful will we be will be determined by our commitment. We are called to be God's people. My question is, how will you respond to God's call? Thomas A. Jackson has written a hymn that's in our hymn book. The words of that hymn go this way. We are called to be God's people, showing by our lives his grace, one in heart and one in spirit, sign of hope for all the race. Let us show how he has changed us and remade us as his own. Let us share our life together as we shall around his throne. Let's pray together. Father, we come this morning to declare that we have been called to be your people. And Lord, it's my prayer this morning that we would respond to that call by saying all that you have spoken, we will do. 
Lord, as we open our hearts to receive Christ Jesus, as we follow him as Lord of our lives, lives day by day, remind us we are special to you out of all the people of the earth because, Lord, you want to use us to reach all the people of the earth that they too might become your special people. Remind us, Father, our lives are reflect your glory and your grace and your holiness. And remind us also, Father, that as we will by faith say yes, you will empower us to be obedient and to be your people. Lord, I pray for someone this morning that has never opened their heart to Christ. And I pray, Lord, this morning that they would understand and desire to be a part of your forever family and would understand that it's only through faith in Christ that can be possible. That they desire to be a part of what you're doing in this world. And again, begin to understand it begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you just have your way in our lives this morning as, Father, we respond to the call to be your people. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing that hymn. We are called to be God's people. As God speaks to your heart, as you're ready to say yes to whatever that call is, I'll be standing down here to receive you. And I invite you to come.